So capacitors. Capacitors are things that are used in electric circuits. If you've heard about them before, you've probably thought, oh, it's a thing you put in a circuit. I don't know what it does, except I've watched Back to the Future, and so I know a flux capacitor allows you to travel through time. <laughs> but, okay, yes, they're things in electric circuits. We will play with them in electric circuits. We will think about what they do in electric circuits. But for now, we're thinking about them as a thing that allows us to think about electric potential and charge. And capacitance allows the recognition that if you have an arrangement of conductors with maybe insulators between them, there's a relationship between the electric field, sorry, rather, well, yes-ish, but the electric potential difference between two conductors and the charge stored on each conductor that does not depend on the charge itself, only depends on the geometry and the nature of what's there. So capacitance is the thing that encapsulates all that. All right, so first, first problem. A capacitor with capacitance C equals 250 microfarads. All right, and remember, micro is a prefix that means 10 to the minus sixth. It is built from a pair of conductors with nothing, i.e. vacuum, between them. So the, what that means is that the uh, relative permittivity of that thing is just uh, one, so you don't have to worry about it. It's connected to a 12 volt power supply the capacitor charges up. So the circuit diagram for this would just be this. Right, where the two same length plates of the capacitor that has capacitance C. This is the battery, the power supply, and we're going to say V is 12 volts. So when it's hooked up like this, um, because along the wire there's no potential difference, that means the difference from one side to the other of the capacitor is 12 volts. So we can use Q equals C V, where this is the potential difference across the capacitor. That's the charge and that's the capacitance, and that just gives us the answer pretty straight. It's going to be 250 times 10 to the minus 6 farads times um, 12 volts. Right, so you just multiply these two together and you're going to get, uh, let's see, so 250 and 2 times 25 is 50. You're going to get 300 if I did that right. Um, 300 times 10 to the minus 5 coulombs, which is the same as 5, 4, 3. Uh, 3.0 times 10 to the minus 3 coulombs. So that's the amount of charge that's on the capacitor. Now notice when we say that, the implication is that there's plus Q on one and minus Q on the other side of the capacitor. So really the capacitor as a whole has no charge on it, no net charge. So a capacitor, we will say a capacitor stores charge, but it doesn't really. It stores charge separation. We really want it stores is energy in the form of separating charges. So we say the amount of charge on a capacitor, the implication is it has plus that on one plate and minus that on the other plate. So that's what you get in this case. All right, second question, how much energy is stored in the capacitor? Well, you know that the total energy, electrical energy stored in a capacitor is one half CV squared. So in this case, that's 100 times 250 times 10 to the minus six farads times 12 volts squared. Now I'm gonna be a little bit more anal about units here. So we have 100 times 250 times 10 to the minus six. And what's a farad? Well, you can figure out what a farad is just from looking at this. So a farad has to be a coulomb per volt. So that when you multiply coulombs per volt times volts, you get coulombs. So we'll call that a coulomb per volt, okay? Oh, but what's a volt? Well, I'm going to do this in a weird way. Notice we have 12 volts squared. So I'm going to say that is 12 squared times volts, and then I'm going to expand the other volt into joules per coulomb, right? So we know a volt is a joule per coulomb uh, because of this equation, delta PE equals Q delta V. So if you move a charge Q through potential difference delta V, the change of its potential energy, electrical potential energy is that. So you know that joules has to equal coulombs times volts. So a volt has to be a joule per coulomb. Now, why did I turn volts squared and make one of the volts volts and the other is joules per coulomb because I could cancel this one with that one. Oh, cancel this with that. So I'm going to get joules and now I'm not going to try and multiply 250 by 144 in my head. I'll do that on my calculator. All right, and the result is 3.6 times 10 to the minus 2 joules. So that's not a whole lot of energy. What that means is that if you have a um, 12 microfarad capacitor and you put 12 volts across it, you're not going to kill anybody with the electric charge, which is probably a good thing. All right, part C. Suppose you have a capacitor with the same geometry, but which is filled with a film dielectric material that has a dielectric constant, epsilon sub r 
of 3.0, and these things are unitless. Now how much charge is stored in the capacitor and how much energy is stored in the capacitor? And now you go scurrying to the notes and you say, well, there's no equation for this because you haven't told us what kind of capacitor it is. So then you go and you assume, well, let's just assume that it's a um, parallel plate capacitor. And so we know that the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor is, um, my brain died, A, okay, <laughs> got that, A is, um, not A. The capacitance is A over 4 pi K D. Now here's the thing. Usually when I do this I use a different constant rather than K, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and then when you have an epsilon R, it's epsilon R. So you think, oh, so here the way I can do this is that the capacitance with epsilon R equals whatever it is, divided by the capacitance with no epsilon R is A over 4 pi kd, right? So that's the capacitance there. So if I take this capacitance divided by that capacitance, the ratio is just E sub r. So the new capacitance is not E sub r, epsilon sub r higher. And that would be correct. Um, except that it turns out you don't need for this to be a parallel plate capacitor for this to work. We assumed a parallel plate capacitor to come up with this, but it turns out that any geometry you have, if you start with vacuum between it, and you replace all of the vacuum with dielectric that has this dielectric constant, then the new capacitance is that. So now let's think about what happens. If the capacitance goes up three times, but the voltage stays the same, the charge will go up three times. So what I'm saying is, where do I want to do this? I'll do this over here. I'll do it in another color. I don't know why, there's a good reason. So the charge when I have epsilon in there is equal to the capacitance when I have epsilon in there times V. And I say that divided by the old charge is going to be, well, that divided by that. It's the same V. It's just C epsilon over C, which is just 3 in this case. So now I know for part C that the charge, the capacitor 1 I've put epsilon in is just 9.0 times 10 to the minus 3 because it's 3 times what I had before. Um, I also ask... Now, how much energy is stored in the capacitor? It's going to be the same thing. Notice if I replace this with something three times bigger, the energy is going to go up by a factor of three. So that's um, so 3.6. So 3 times 3 is 9, and 6 times 3 is 18. So 9 plus 1.8 is 10.8. So I'm going to get 1.08 times 10 to the minus 1 joules is the amount of energy we have. So all I did was take this and multiply it by 3, and I knew I could do that because of this. Again, if you wanted to write the equations out, I would say energy, when you have epsilon R in, is equal to 1 half the new capacitance times the voltage squared, and it's the same voltage. If I divide it by the old energy, I divide by this, so the 1 halves cancel, the V squareds cancel, I just get it C epsilon R over C, which I know is 3, really 3.0, because that's what I told you that epsilon R is. And that's this ratio. All right, so that's just a basic problem with playing with this equation, given the capacitance and given a voltage, how much charge is on the capacitor. Here's how you do that. How much energy is stored in the capacitor. Here's how you do that. That's the first problem. In the second problem, we have a capacitor constructed of two plates with area equal to one square meter. Right, so a square meter is pretty, it's like this, right? That's a square meter, roughly. So the area is one square meter. They are separated by 1.5 millimeters, which is, of course, 0 0.0015 meters, or 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. Three ways of saying the same thing. And filled with a dielectric with a dielectric constant of epsilon r is equal to 4.5. Right, so the sandwich picture we have here is that there's a capacitor. It's filled with um, a dielectric. So this is like an ice cream sandwich, right? There's the, uh, there's the top cookie, there's the bottom cookie, and then there's the ice cream in between. So the, the surface area of this is one square meter, so it might be like a one meter by one meter plate. This distance, so I've clearly not drawn this to scale, is 1.5 millimeters. And this junk in between is some sort of insulating material whose dielectric constant, the way we've defined these things, is 4.5, which tells you something about how polarized it gets when you put an electric field on it. And then it's charged up to 5 volts. So 
I also have across this a delta V from one side to the other of 5 volts. Hey, how much energy is stored in the capacitor? Well, okay, remember, it's not equals. The energy in a capacitor is 1 half CV squared. What is C for a capacitor? Well, parallel plate capacitors is the one case where I've actually given you the equation for capacitance. One of the things you do if you take a more advanced physics class sometimes, so I had to do a lot of this when I was uh, in college and when I taught physics one at Caltech as a graduate student, we had all kinds of stuff like this where you make people figure out what's the capacitance of all sorts of wacky geometries, um, which involves doing integrals and stuff. But we're not going to do that. I have told you, however, that um, a capacitor is epsilon R A over 4 pi K D for a parallel plate capacitor with area A entirely filled with dielectric with epsilon R separated by distance D has that capacitance. So that tells us that the energy in this case is just one half epsilon R A V squared over four pi K D. So that's very exciting. So now I know everything I need to calculate the amount of energy stored. So it's one half. Dielectric constant is a unitless 4.5. The area is 1.0 meters squared. Um, the, uh, Ener or not the energy, the voltage is 5 volts, but I'm going to write a volt as a joule per coulomb. And in fact, I'm going to expand the joule out into kilogram meters squared per second squared so that I can make sure all the units properly cancel uh, squared. Divided by 4 times pi, and then 8.9876 times 10 to the 9th. So this is K. And remember, the units of K are newton meter squared per coulomb squared, and I'm going to expand the newton out to kilogram meters. So kilogram meters times meter squared is kilogram meters cubed per coulomb squared. Um, all very exciting. That's K, and then D is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. So let's think about units. So on the top, meter squared squared is meters to the fourth, and then meter squared. So I have meters to the sixth on the top. Oh my word. Then on the bottom, I have meters cubed times meters, so that's meters to the fourth. So whatever my answer is, we'll just have meters in it. I have kilograms squared on the top and kilograms on the bottom. Sorry, meters to the sixth divided by meters to the fourth is meters squared. So that's what I should have said for meters. Um, kilograms squared divided by kilograms, so I just have kilograms. Let's think about the coulombs. I have one over coulomb squared divided by one over coulomb squared, so all the coulombs go away. And then finally, I have... Um, I am now distressed second squared squared, so I have per seconds to the fourth. Uh, and you know why? Because I left out the second squared here, because K was is Newton meter squared per coulomb squared, and Newton's has a second squared in it that I forgot. So I should have had that there. So now I have second squared squared in the denominator, divided by second squared in the denominator. So I'm just left with second squared in the denominator. Hey, look, that's a joule. So good, the units are going to work right. Now it's just a matter of putting the numbers into the calculator. And the result I get is 3.32 times 10 to the minus 7. Although really I only have two sig figs, so I'll write it as, you know, in fact, if you want to keep an extra digit, which you should, you should always want to keep an extra digit, this is 3.320 times 10 to the minus 7. So that's enough I could use it again if I need it. So the number of sig figs I have is 3.32 times 10 to the minus 7th joules. That is the amount of energy, a really tiny amount of energy, right? You think, damn, these capacitors, that's a square meter, and it's really close. 1.5 millimeters, well, that's actually not all that close, it turns out, as capacitors go. Um, and that's all the more energy it stores at 5 volts. How pathetic. Well, okay. That means that building capacitors is actually a little harder than that. So we'll deal with that. Part B. What is the charge on one plate of the capacitor? This is easier uh, because, well, it's about equivalently easy. So in part B, we say Q is equal to CV. So I don't even have to do any algebra to solve this, just like last time. So the capacitance, again, is epsilon R A, and then I have a V on the top, divided by 4 pi K D. So I will, am I going to regret trying to, I'm going to run out of board space. But I'm going to do it anyway because, you know, forethought is for for thoughtful people. Five volts, and then what is a volt? A volt is a joule per coulomb, so I'm gonna write it as kilogram meter squared per coulomb second squared, because that's what a volt is, and that'll allow me to make sure that the units are coming out right. Divided by four times pi, and then K 
is 8.9876 times 10 to the ninth, and it's Newton meter squared per coulomb squared. So a Newton is a kilogram meter squared, sorry, kilogram meter, and times meter squared gives you kilogram meters cubed. This time I'm not forgetting the second squared, coulomb squared, and then D is 0 0.0015 meters. So let's look at the units. I have, again, meters squared times meters squared is meters to the fourth divided by meters cubed times meters, all the meters cancel. I have kilograms over kilograms, all the kilograms cancel. I have one over second squared divided by one over second squared, all the seconds cancel. Then I have one over coulombs divided by one over coulombs squared, right? So one over coulombs over one over coulombs squared. What do I do if I multiply the top and bottom by coulomb squared? You can always multiply the top and bottom by the same thing. They cancel, that cancels that, I get coulombs. So yes, I'm going to get an answer in coulombs. The units work. Let's put the numbers in the calculator. The result I get is 1.328 times 10 to the minus 7th coulombs to the right number of sig figs. That is 1.3 times 10 to the minus 7th coulombs. That's the amount of charge stored on the capacitor. Part C, what is the electric field in the capacitor? Well, okay, one way you could do this is you could say, oh, well, I know that it's a charge, uh, it's a plate with area A, and I know what the electric field over a plate with area A is because I can look that up in the notes, but I'm going to do this a slightly sneakier way. And that is to just think about um, what electric, how electric field and voltage relate to each other. So let's suppose that's the plus and that's the minus. We know that V is, uh, or sorry, the electric field is going to point from the plus to the minus. All right. Well, we also know that the potential energy, if you take a charge Q and you move it from here to here, then it's going to go through a voltage of delta V, and so the energy it loses is going to be Q delta V. Well, that's also going to be equal to the work that you have to, that's done on the part of sort of by the electric field, which is Q E D. Okay. So if I say in, in magnitude Q E D has to equal Q delta V, then I say, oh, so the electric field just has to equal delta V over D. Oh yeah, that's right, and that's why it's volts per meter. We talked about this before. So in this case, I can say the electric field in between, the magnitude of the electric field is five volts divided by um, 1.5 times 10 to the minus three meters. All right, so we have to divide five divided by 1.5 times 10 to the minus three. Well, let's think about five divided by 1.5. 1.5 times 3 is 4.5, right, because you get a 3 plus a 1.5, so that's 4.5, so there's at least 3, and then we're at 4.5 to get to 5, I need another one-third of 1 1.5, which is 0.5, so we know this is going to be um, 3 and a third, so I'll write this as 3.3, because I only have two sig figs, but if I needed more, there's just more 3s, then I have a 1 over 10 to the 3, which is 10 to the 3, um, and then that's volts per meter, so that's the magnitude of the electric field. Of course, the question asks for the electric field, which is a vector. So really, to be right, I would say pointing from plus plate to minus plate. And now I have given a full specification of the electric field. So that's that part. And then in the final part, what is the electric field just from the charge on the plates in the capacitor? Oh. Well, now we have to think harder. So now what I am going to do is go ahead and do what I said I was going to do in the first place. All right, so here's the electric field I thought of, I figured out just by thinking about the voltage. So what is the electric field just from the charge on the plates? So for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider that we have two plates. So I'll start with one plate. This plate has charge Q and it has area A. So I have the electric field from this plate. Let's go ahead and define an axis now so I can just do it. Um, is 2 pi um, k q over a, right? That's the um, electric field. Did I do that right? I think I did. Um, I should look this up to make sure I did it right. So I will later, and if I did it wrong, I'll just re-record this. You won't even know I've said this, so it's like I don't even exist. Unless I actually, this recording is right, and then I use it, and then I do exist. This is so meta. Um, the electric field, so that's just from the positive plate, and then, so we'll call that E+. We also have a negative plate up here. It also has an electric field 
from the negative plate, which is also 2 pi k q over a y hat, right, because the electric field here points towards the negative plate. So the total electric field between the two is just going to be the sum, do you like how my pi looks like a k, is the sum of those two, which is 4 pi k q over a y hat. And now I can put these numbers in. Oh, but I don't have q. Well, what am I going to do about q? That's not too hard because I know that Q is equal to CV. And uh, so let's think about this a little bit harder. What am I going to do about this? Q is equal to CV. And I know that C, you're going to discover this, this simplifies out nicely when you do all the algebra first. So C for a parallel plate capacitor is A over 4 pi KD right, times V. So I can substitute that in and I will get 4 pi k over a times q, which is, um, I left off that. Epsilon r, of course, is part of the capacitance, and this is very important here, times epsilon r a over 4 pi k d um, times v y hat. But now, hey, check this out. 4 pi cancels 4 pi. K cancels K, A cancels A, and I'm left with epsilon R, uh, V over D, Y hat. Hey, you had V over D before. I did. But notice there's an epsilon R here. And epsilon R is 4.5, so it's got to be 4.5 higher than 3 and a third. I could, I'm not going to do that in my head. And I get uh, 1.50 times 10 to the 4 volts per meter E, and now I have a y hat volts per meter, y hat. That's what E just from the charge on the plate is, Q on P, I'll call that, right? So that's what I get here. Now this, now that I have this direction, I can go ahead and put the, in fact, I'll do this here. I know I'm gonna call that y hat now, and I'll say that's E. So here's the interesting thing. And so then the last question is, how much electric field do I have just from the dielectric? So I need to modify this picture over here. And um, in between, you have this dielectric, this blob of it. It's going to be all polarized stuff, right? So the plus, the little induced dipoles, the plus is pulled towards the negative plate, and the negative is pulled towards the positive plate. And the result of all of this is going to be some um, electric field of the dielectric. I'll call that E sub D that way. And so then the total electric field is really the electric field due to the plus plate plus the electric field due to the minus plate plus the electric field due to the dielectric. So the electric field due to the dielectric, of course, is just the electric field, the total electric field minus the electric field due to Q on P. What? Well, because Q on P is E plus plus E minus. That's what we just did. So, uh -huh. so now I can say that the total electric field is 3.3 .3 times 10 to the 3 volts per meter y hat minus 1.50 times 10 to the 4 volts per meter y hat. So to make this easier to look at, I'm going to turn the 3.3 .3 times 10 to the 3 into 0.33 times 10 to the 4. So if I subtract 1.5 from 0.33, what do I get? I get minus 1 point, let's see, um, 0.33 minus 5 is like 17, right? So it's going to be minus 1.17 times 10 to the 4 volts per meter y hat. That's the electric field due to the dielectric. So the net electric field is actually quite a bit smaller than what it would be without the dielectric, because you have this, but then the dielectric has some electric field that subtracts off because it's in the opposite direction. And then the net you get is that. Right. So there I am thinking about the electric field inside one of these little capacitors. And that is the second problem. What is the capacitance of two capacitors, each of capacitance C, connected in parallel? And then I describe what that is, so I'll just draw this here. What that means is that I have a battery and then I have one capacitor here, and I have another capacitor here. So when I say in parallel, and we'll talk about this for resistors as well, what that means is that one circuit element, and or that the two circuit elements have their one side connected to each other, boom, and have the other side connected to each other, boom. So this is what in parallel means. You can see they're right next to each other. They both have the same relationship with the battery as each other, okay? So those are those, that is V. 
And what I want to say, and so I say, what is the capacitance of these two together? So this is another thing we will do in circuit elements, is that suppose I've given you a black box with two leads on it, right? And you connect a wire to this lead, and you connect a wire to that lead. You don't know what's in the black box. You measure the capacitance, and you say, oh, what you have is this. You have a capacitor in there with some capacitance that I'm going to call CEFF for effective capacitance. Now really you built it like this. So the question is, what is the effective capacitance that you get by putting these two capacitors together in this way? How do you figure that out? And I'm going to give you two ways to think about this. The first is kind of the heuristic way. Let's imagine that these are actually parallel plate capacitors, right? So you have one capacitor like this. I'm just going to stop drawing out like this for reasons that will be obvious in a moment. And then you have the other capacitor, which you have colored purple for no adequately explained reason. Now, here's the thing. If this is connected to this, right? And remember, this is just a wire, which means charge can flow freely from here to here, because a wire is metal, and we're assuming it's a perfect conductor, which is a decent approximation for most wires in most circuits. So we're assuming it's a perfect conductor, which means charge here and here can freely move between each other. That would be basically the same thing as if I had just abutted them next to each other and allowed charge to just flow straight rather than through a wire, right? So this is really what it would look like if you had these two guys abutted next to each other. Ugh, ugh, right, and so now you're saying if these were parallel plate capacitors, then I could say, aha, uh -huh, now I know what to do. Because um, why is this so stiff? Okay, because I have, you know, C here and C here. Um, well, I know that C for just one of them is, if we say this is surface area A and this is D, right? so capacitance for one of them is A over 4 pi K D. Well, and then I have another one. So the total capacitance, the total area of this one of these plates is just twice as much, but the D is exactly the same because they're the same distance apart. So I would expect my effective capacitance to be 2C, right? But what if it's not a parallel plate capacitor? Do I get the same answer? So here's another way you can think about this. Um, we know that, so let's, we're going to call this um, number one. We're going to call this number two. And you know that V1 equals V2 is equal to just the voltage across this battery, where this is the potential difference across one capacitor, that's the potential difference across the other capacitor. The total charge stored, well, you've got a plus Q here and a minus Q here, and a plus Q here and a minus Q here, so the total charge stored is actually 2Q, right? Because I have a Q here and I have another Q here. That's very exciting. So the total charge is Q, 2Q, all right, and so I know that Q tote is equal to C effective times V because it's just the same V across both of them, All right? So Q tote is C effective V, right? That's from the point of view of, of the leads going in. It's like I sent this much charge through and there's this much potential difference across it. So that's what this is gonna be, all right? And since Q tote is 2Q, I know that 2Q over V is equal to C effective, but notice here that just by Q equals CV, Q over V is just C, so C effective is 2C. So the way, so I did this first by thinking about what if it's parallel plate capacitors, but now I say, well, okay, what if, what if we forget about that it's parallel plate capacitors, and I just think about the circuit, I think about where is their Q, and where is their delta V, and I think, okay, we'll be careful here. The delta V from top to bottom on these and this is the same, so they have the same voltage across them, but they each are storing, they're each separating charge of Q. So I figure out the total charge is Q, and then just by thinking Q tote is C effective V, I can figure out what C effective must be in terms of C. So this is the answer. When you put two capacitors in parallel like that, the effective capacitance of the whole thing is double. So that gives you a sense of, ah, if I want a big capacitance, what can I do? Just put a whole bunch of capacitors next to each other. Now, you know, a bank of capacitors. And now you have a higher total capacitance. So that's the third problem. All right, we've done two capacitors in parallel. Now we want two, two capacitors in series. So in series means you just do one in the row after the other, like this. Now. 
you might have thought, well, we put two in parallel, and there were twice as many capacitors, so the capacitance was twice as much. And here, there's twice as many capacitors, so it's going to be twice as much. And that would be too simplistic thinking. Right? And notice that that wasn't how I decided two in parallel was twice as much. I thought I had a lot more thinking involved in that. And the fact is, they're not hooked up the same way, so you can't assume the result is going to be the same. So we're going to think about this just like we did last time, which imagine inside the dotted line is a black box. So I've given you a black box with two leads and said, measure the capacitance. So from your point of view, what you have is a thing, and if I say measure the capacitance, you say, okay, so there's a capacitor in there. Let's see what the effective capacitance is. And then what we want to do is figure out what is this effective capacitance that you would measure in terms of the two Cs. So I want to think about this the same two ways. So we're going to start. So imagine you have a little charge ohmmeter here which will it'll sort of be like an ammeter. We'll talk about that later. We have a little charge ohmmeter that figures out how much charge comes in here. And one thing that'll happen in an electric circuit is unless you have a capacitor, in fact, nowhere in an electric circuit can you build up a net charge, right? In the capacitor, you build up a net charge, but you'll have sort of a plus Q on one plate, and then you get minus Q on the other plate. So since there's nowhere else to build up a charge, however much charge goes in here, the same amount of charge must come out here which means you must have a minus Q on that plate, so you have a plus Q on this plate. Which, and these are all the same Qs. Say, so, okay, well, so that's interesting. So let's go and pretend they're parallel plate capacitors, and what do we really have when we have a couple of parallel plate capacitors in, in a row? Let's draw them closer together so it's obvious which is which capacitor. So we have um, two capacitors that um, I tell you they're the same capacitance of each other, so they have the same area and distance if they're just parallel plate capacitors. And then I've connected this one to this one, and then there's plus Q on this guy, minus Q on this guy, and plus Q on this guy, and minus Q on this guy. Well, all right, so now notice because this whole thing, this plate plus this conductor plus this plate, is one conductor, a charge could freely move through a conductor. If I were to just move these two capacitors together, it doesn't really change anything, right? There's no electric field in here, right? Because this, notice this whole inner part is neutral. So there's no electric field here. There's only, I'll draw electric fields in orange. There's only some electric field here, right, in between those two. And there's also electric field here in between these two. But there's no electric field there, so I won't change anything if I move these guys close together. In fact, as I, I can move them closer and closer and closer together until they're on top of each other. And if you have a plate with minus Q and a plate with plus Q occupying the same space, that's the same as not having a plate at all. Right? What I would have in that case is this with the plate in the middle that has no net charge on it. So I draw it, drew it dotted. Minus Q. They're now a distance 2D apart rather than just D. And there's electric field and it's the same electric field in each case, and it's just over twice as big a distance, right? Well, okay, so now knowing that there's 2D, and we know that the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor is A over four pi K D, so I'm gonna say D tote here, and then C effective is A over four pi K D tote, which I could write is um, C effective is A over four pi k d tote, in this case is two d, which I could write as one half a over four pi k d. And hey, look, that's the capacitance of one of these. So the capacitance, the effective capacitance, we expect from thinking about it this way is one half the capa total capacitance. Well, that's interesting. So now, okay, so that's thinking about it as if they were parallel plate capacitors, but let's do the same thing we did last time, and let's think about it in the circuit. So if you have a voltage V and your effective capacitor has you know, Q on the whatever top plate you see, whatever this side of the capacitor, you sent that much Q in, you get this much Q out, you've added it all up so you know the Q you put on it. You know that the Q is equal to C effective times V or C effective is equal to Q over V. All right. Okay, that's good. Let's go back and look at these two capacitors here. All right, so they've got Q. We've already argued they have Q on it, but what's the voltage across this capacitor? Well, here's the thing. Remember where voltage came from. Remember, we started by saying delta V is E dot delta R, except it was minus E dot delta R, right? Delta V is minus E dot delta R. And if you go, we'll look at this drawing again, but I'm gonna do it over here, and I'll just draw it in circuit element style. 
we know that the total potential difference between this point and this point is just whatever the voltage of the battery is. We also know that there's only electric field here and there's only electric field here and they're in the same direction. So if I thought about doing this E dot delta R, I'd get a certain amount of potential difference here, right, with this at higher than that, so potential is going down as you go that way. Certain amount here, another certain amount here, because these capacitors have the same charge and they have the same C, you know that the potential difference in each one is the same as each other. So to get this and this to total to V, the delta V across each one of these must be V over 2. That's the total capacitance over each one of those. Well, that's interesting. So knowing that, I can now know that C is equal to Q times V over 2. You say, wait, I thought Q was CV. Okay, yes, in general, in this problem, I have defined V to be the voltage of this battery, Q to be this um, Q, and that to be that C. So because this V is actually twice the voltage across one of these, I have to write it like that in this case. So C is equal to QV over 2. Well, that's the same as 2 times Q over V, right? I factor out this 1 half, and it's 1 over 1 half, which is 2. 1 divided by 1 half is 2, which is 2, because notice C effective is Q over V, C effective. So I get that C effective is C over 2, again, by thinking about it this way. So that's what happens. When you put two capacitors in series, you get a lower capacitance. It's just like having put a wider capacitor. Remember, you want them narrower to have a higher capacitance. That's the fourth problem. We actually have a fifth problem this time. The fifth problem has that really scary word in it, which is derive. And there's a rule in physics, which is don't drink and derive. We want to derive this. What the hell do I mean? That means start with other more basic stuff we know and show that this expression is right. So one thing you could do is, well, think about what the units are. The units work, but you're not going to get the one half from that. Where does the one half come from? And it says, by considering the work it takes, ah, that's cool. I know how work works, right? Because remember, initial energy plus work is equal to final energy if there's no heat flow, which there won't be. The work it takes to pull one plate of a parallel plate capacitor away from the other. So what we have is one parallel capacitor, plate capacitor, we'll say has a positive charge, and another parallel plate that has a negative charge. And I want to think, if I want to move this over some distance, delta r, how much work does it take for me to pull this thing apart? OK, well, let's figure that out. Um, and here's the way you can figure that out. Um, you'll start with the two plates right on top of each other. You know the electric field here over a big plate. Right, so this is the electric field just from the positive plate. Is equal to 2 pi k q over a. Okay. So it actually doesn't depend on how far apart you how far apart you are. That's nice. Constant electric field. Okay. What is the electric force on this plate? So I can draw a free body diagram for this plate. It's going to have an electric force on it. And then if you're pulling it apart, it's going to have the force of, of you pulling. I'll call that F pull. Right? So the electric force would tend to pull them together, which you then wonder, why don't capacitors just collapse then? Well, they would, but they have dielectric between them holding them apart. Usually that's what happens. Or you've just built metal with insulating rods at the end to hold them. Something else holds them apart. But in this case, you have two plates and you're pulling them apart. So if you want to pull them apart, the total amount of work you're going to do is going to be F pull dot delta R. Okay, so you're, you, all right, so in this case, you want to pull them through a distance of, let's call it D, right? Because the final distance D, oh, that's something we might use in a capacitor. So we want delta R to equal D, and let's call Y hat that direction. And then F pull, What's F pull equal to? Uh, well, if you want to pull it at a constant speed, F pull is going to have to equal Fe. And you might as well just pull at a constant speed because that makes life easier. So F pull is going to equal the magnitude of Fe, but in the plus y hat direction. And Fe, what is Fe? Well, you have a total charge of negative Q here. And everywhere you have that negative Q, it's in this electric field. So Fe 
is going to be minus Q times the electric field. In this electric field, I was a horrible person because I didn't include the vector. So vector electric field, y hat. The electric field is 2 pi k q over a y hat. So the electric field is minus 2 pi k q squared over a y hat. So the absolute value of Fe is just that. So good. So now we know what F, F pull is. So the total amount of work it will take for you to exert this force over a distance delta r, which we're going to say is dy hat, is going to be 2 pi k q squared over a y hat. So that's Fe, or sorry, F pull rather, the absolute value of Fe, or the magnitude of Fe in the plus y direction, dotted with d in the y hat direction. And y hat dot y hat is 1. Right, so what I can do is factor out all the scalars. I'll do that. Q squared D over A um, times y hat dot y hat, which is just 1. So what we get is 2 pi K Q squared D over A. All right, well, that's interesting. But what can we even do with that? We don't know yet. We're not done yet. So the total amount of work it does is that. But we know we want to have it in terms of c and v squared. So what is capacitance for this capacitor once you get to d? Right, so assuming that, oh, that that's a horrible way to say it. We'll say that distance is d, delta r is d minus zero, right, because you start with them right on top of each other. So when, when you have this final distance, you know that the capacitance is, is a over 4 pi k d. Very exciting. Um, oh, but look, oh, look, I have an A over a little 2 pi. Huh, don't know what's going on there yet, but we'll get to it. Um, you also want to have a V in there, and you know that V is equal to, well, let's start with the one that's easier to say, right? Q is CV, so therefore V is equal to Q over C. Oh, well, let's see. So we want to get towards, so Q over C, and we have this here, and we want to get a CV squared. Well, notice, if I have a CV squared, that's going to be, um, well, all right, here's the thing. Let's, let's substitute out this Q here, okay? Um, and if we substitute out, out this Q, I'm going to substitute out this Q in terms of CV. Let's just see where it goes. I happen to know where this is going. Um, there's a few different ways you could get to this. So I'm going to switch colors. Uh, back to purple here. I'm going to start with this work here. It's equal to 2 pi K, and then Q, we're going to replace with CV, um, but we'll call it C squared V squared, because it's Q squared, of course, um, times D over A. Now I'm going to rewrite this as 4 pi K D over A. Because I have a 4, I have to have a 1 half to make it the same, times C squared V squared. Notice this is 1 over C, right? C is A over 4 pi KD. So A under 4 pi KD is 1 over C. So I have 1 half times 1 over C times C squared V squared. That cancels one of the C's. I get 1 half C V squared. And so when the two plates are on top of each other, no charge is separated. Let's call that, you know, it's just like a neutral thing. We'll call that zero energy. How much energy does it take to pull them apart? Or how much work does it take is that much. So if EI is zero, then the final energy, which is the energy when you've pulled them apart, is this much. And so there you get the one half CV squared. By considering the force and considering how much work it would take to pull them apart, you can actually derive this potential energy expression. You have to have a little bit of algebraic insight to see here, oh, I have a 2 pi KD over A. I can turn that into a C, and I can turn the Q squareds into Cs and Vs, and then, hey, it all works. That's the last problem. Um, I am the worst person ever. I'm going to start this over.